we go to events today all around the world. We see people very excited about artificial intelligence. I would like to know what specifically about AI at this moment excites you. Oh, too many things to, to list them all, but uh, you know, ultimately, um, AI is going to help us uh, be smarter ourselves. It's going to assist us. And uh, intelligence is, you know, the commodity that is in the highest demand if you want to, you know, want to make the world better. And, and so, um, so that's the, the, the long-term effect of AI, right? The positives, the benefits uh, of, of, uh, of AI technology. But in the short term, uh, what does AI do to us today? And it's used in transportation. All of our cars now have you know, assistance, driving assistance systems in them that makes the car stop automatically if there is an obstacle, and eventually the car will drive themselves, not yet, uh, completely. Uh, in healthcare, in drug design, in uh, science, material design, for example, material science, chemistry, uh, a lot of promises there that are really exciting for the progress of uh, science and technology where, where AI is, is gonna help us make uh, faster progress. Uh, in all, all, all kinds of domains. So that is really exciting on the side of uh, applications. And of course, um, the biggest deployment of AI today it might surprise you, but it's a little behind the scenes. It's basically content moderation on communication networks, social networks in particular. Uh, and that actually is a very complex uh, uh, problem. Um, a lot of people today are really scared about the use of AI for things like disinformation and hate speech and you know, all kinds of nefarious uh, uh, purpose. But in fact, for all of those problems, AI currently is actually the solution. It's not the problem, it's the solution. It is with AI that we detect all those, kind of, all those bad things that, that uh, need to be dealt with. Um, so, you know, the negatives, people pay too much attention to the negatives, I think. Yeah, and, uh, if you allow me, these applications that we are seeing now, protein folding, large language models, all of these different technologies that are based today on AI technol uh, technologies are powered by compute capability. There is a number that we usually hear, and is that no nation, no company, no organization, no research institution can be relevant in the world of AI today if they do not have access to a minimum of 10,000 GPUs. 10,000 GPUs. Is this number correct? Yeah, if you want to be on, on top of the, the research, uh, like at the frontier of AI research. Uh, the threshold is basically a supercomputer composed of uh, lots of GPUs that are tightly interconnected using optical communication. And the, the basic unit there is, is 16,000 GPUs for various economical reasons. That's basically a billion dollars or more. Um, and you know, it's it's a big infrastructure. So, large tech companies like 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 Meta, you know, Google, Microsoft, and, and a few others have the capability for this. But it's really in the hands of a small number. Now, these things are for training what we call foundation models or base models, right? Those this is very expensive. It requires a lot of expertise, a lot of computation, uh, and if you want to do a, be at the top, you know, you need at least that much uh, resources unless you come up with some new concepts that nobody has thought about before, which may, which may occur. Uh, but then, once those base models have been trained, fine-tuning them for your interest, your local language, culture, centers of interest, value system, whatever it is, it's not that expensive. A lot of people can do this. Small companies can do this. But one of the things that a lot of countries could do to basically as a springboard to creating an, an ecosystem of AI in the country is to provide uh, relatively cheap uh, compute resources, not just to, to startups, um, uh, large companies usually can afford to do this, but not just to startups, but also to academic groups. Um, that, that's really crucial because academic groups at the moment are, particularly in certain areas, are wondering whether they can contribute at all because they don't, most of them don't have access to enough uh, computing resources. Um, so, a billion dollars, 16,000 GPUs, um, if a nation or a developing nation or a company or a startup doesn't want to invest that amount, they can leverage open source 
technology is what I'm saying. And uh, I know Meta is very big on this with the Llama uh, models. The UAE has invested very heavily with, uh, with Falcon LLM as well. Um, please explain to us a little bit more what about open source and how can this be leveraged by, by developing nations and, and companies? Yeah, so I, I think AI is, is going to, to be viewed as a, as a, as a foundation platform, a software platform, a little bit like the software platform of the internet. Right, so the internet runs on open source software, Linux, Apache, MySQL, you know, et cetera, right? All the software stack. Um, and it's not just the internet, your, 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 you know, the entire cell phone system runs on open source software. You don't realize that, but, um, uh, but cell phone towers run on open source software stacks. So the, the reason for this is that whenever a piece of software is infrastructure, it needs to be shared, it needs to be secure, and safe, and the best way for it to be secure and safe is to have a lot of eyeballs looking at the source code and fine tuning it and improving it. So I think you know, AI is gonna be a common infrastructure because uh, it's going to be like the repository of all human knowledge, if you want, to some extent. All of our digital diet is gonna be mediated by those AI systems. We're not gonna to go to a search engine anymore. We're just gonna be talk talking to our AI assistant. It's gonna be living in our mobile phones, perhaps, but perhaps in smart glasses. Right, so you're walking around and you know you don't know where to go. You ask your assistant, like you know, where am I now? What is this building? And the system, you know, there's a camera and it can tell you this. You can basically buy today, or if not today, within three months. Um, so you know, we're going to be talking with our assistant all the time, which means our digital diet is going to be mediated by those systems, which is why it needs to be open, diverse, free to some extent, uh, just like the press, just like the media. Um, we need a diversity of uh, AI assistants uh, so that we're not all kind of, you know, getting the same information from the same source. Um, I want to go back to the 16,000 GPUs for just one, one moment here. How long do you foresee this demand on computing power will remain? We saw in the blockchain when it first came out, it was very uh, compute intensive. There were fundamental shifts in how the blockchain operated, went from proof of work to proof of stake. Um, will we see such a shift in AI? Will algorithms improve that will be more efficient and will not be in this much uh, need of computing power? Uh, it's a two year waiting list today to get access to some of these GPUs from these manufacturers and vendors. Yeah, that's true, and it's in part due to uh, companies like Meta and, and uh, Microsoft, uh, which are the two biggest buyers of GPUs from NVIDIA, from Jensen Wong's company, who was, was here earlier. Um, as well uh, as the UAE now. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know how many GPUs there are in the UAE, but most, most people actually rent GPUs out of cloud service providers, right? They, they don't necessarily have their own, um, their own facilities. Uh, but to give you an idea, by the end of the year, uh, Mark Zuckerberg announced that uh, Meta will basically have access to 600,000 GPUs. Uh, many of them are used for research and development, but most of them are actually used for production. So when you talk to the AI assistant, you need a GPU to run it. Uh, but anyway, so there's going to be a lot of progress, both on the, uh, on, on, the, on the hardware. The hardware is making a lot of progress, not because of Moore's Law, because Moore's Law is kind of s saturating, but because uh, uh, chips are being designed that are more appropriate and more efficient to run the type of neural nets that we are interested in. There's, there's two big families of architectures of neural nets that need to be run efficiently, and you have to figure out you know, what type of... Silicon hardware architecture is appropriate for, for that, and people are making progress uh, along, along, along this line. Uh, so there's progress on that side. There is exploitation of the fact that when you do the computation for a, a deep learning system, a neural network, the, 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 the precision of the computation doesn't need to be very high, only a few bits. The, you know, a normal computer makes calculation on numbers that are represented on 64 bits or 32 bits, uh, but when it's a neural net, you can actually train it with only 16 bits. And once it's trained, you can quantize that down to eight bits or even sometimes four bits, which allows even very large systems to run on sort of more regular hardware. Um, laptops that are gonna come out this year, most of them will have neural net accelerators hardwired in them with enough memory to, um, to run fairly sizable neural net uh, on the laptop. And then, you know, down the, down the line, you're gonna have to, to run very basic 
front-end neural nets on your smart glasses, on your smartphones. Smartphones now come with neural net accelerators, at least at the high end. Uh, there is a lot of research into very low power electronics to put them into, into smart glasses as well. And then pretty soon you'll have um, you know, AI neural net systems in every embedded device. Your, you know, your vacuum cleaner, your automated lawn, lawnmower, you know, cameras maybe on the ceiling of a retirement home that can detect if people fall on, fall on the floor, things like that. Th those things are going to be ev everywhere, including in you know, $3 microcontrollers. Um, a, a lot of these are open source based systems or open source models. Like, you know, again, coming back to Meta's open source systems, Falcon in the UAE, Jace in the UAE. Um, why, if it is so good and it enables developing nations to be able to leverage, enable startups to be able to leverage artificial intelligence, why then are we hearing another side where people are sort of pushing against open source and and, 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 and maybe promoting closed source uh, AI systems, whereas open source really built the internet, built what we see today uh, to a large extent? Well, uh, you know, at the beginning of the internet, uh, the software infrastructure for the internet was actually not open source. It was a big battle between Sun Microsystems and Microsoft to provide the operating systems, web servers, etc. And they both lost, right? They lost to open source platforms because open source platforms make progress faster. So I think we're going to see a similar phenomenon in AI that proprietary platform, there is space for them, um, but they, they belong to a particular business model where you know you basically have a subscription to those systems with an API, uh, but they're difficult to, to um, customize for your own application because you don't have access to the code, you can't port it to your hardware, you can't run it locally, uh, you, know, you have to use servers that are somewhere on the west coast of the US. So it's uh, the amount of uh, the spectrum of applications you can, you can do with closed source system is not as large as with, uh, with open source. And what we're seeing over the last year or so is that the open source uh, models that are being released are, you know, inching their way towards the same level of performance as the best uh, closed source one. Uh, so at some point they're going to cross, and then it'll be the end of uh, a proprietary. Well, what's going to happen now after that is that the the base layer of open source um, is going to be used. There's going to be, you know, three or four good open source platforms that are going to be used by, by everyone to build uh, commercial, possibly cl closed source applications on top of it. Uh, uh, for for businesses, for consumers, for you know government operation, for science, for whatever you want, um, uh, you know as long as the license of the open source are, are sufficiently liberal for that. Uh, so I, I think that's the future. I think it's the better future that we can imagine. But the reason why there is pressure also um, to uh, essentially regulate open source out of existence is because of this imaginary fear that. Powerful AI systems are dangerous. At the moment, they're not. We're really far from human-level intelligence. You know, there were stories about the fact that you could use an LLM to give you instructions of how to make a chemical weapon or bioweapon or something. That turns out to be false. Uh, those systems are trained on public data. They can't really invent anything. So, you know, at least today. Now, in the you know some time in the future, those systems might actually be smart enough to really give you useful information better than you can get with a search engine. But it's just not true today. I heard you once say that if we take all of the data available in the world today, and we take all the AI models developed in the world today, and we put them together into one system, it will still not be as smart as a household cat. Uh, can you please explain a little bit more on this? Yeah, uh, the brain of a, of a house cat <laughs> is, uh, is about 800. 800 million neurons, you have to multiply this by about 2,000 to get the number of uh, synapses, the connections between neurons, which is the equivalent of number of parameters in an LLM. The biggest LLMs that we have at the moment that are practical are, have a few hundred billion uh, parameters, the equivalent of synapses. Um, so we're, we're maybe at the size of a cat, but why is it that those systems are not nearly as smart as a cat? You know, a cat can do... Uh, can remember, first of all, understands the physical world, can plan complex actions, um, can do some level of reasoning, actually much better than the biggest LLMs. And uh, uh, so what that tells you is that we're missing something really, really, conceptually, something really big to get machines to be as intelligent as uh, the type of learning abilities that we observe in animals and humans. We still have some breakthroughs to get through. You know, 
AGI, whatever you want to call it, human level AI, is not just around the corner. There's no question it will happen. There's no question that at some point in the future, we will have machines that are smarter than us in all domains where we're smart. They'll be working for us. They're not going to want to you know, take over the world. Uh, but uh, you know, we'll set their, their goals, um, and they, they'll be executing those goals for us. But, uh, but they will be smarter than us in many ways. Um, but we're not there yet. You know, we, we still have to discover some major breakthroughs before, before we get there. Oh, thank you. Then, you know, I come from the Artificial Intelligence Office of the UAE Federal Government. In, in essence, we are policymakers. But you are coming from the front lines of AI development. Um, we talk about artificial general intelligence. We hear about superhuman intelligence or human level intelligence. How far are we, really? <laughs> uh, uh, will we see it in our lifetime? Uh, maybe in the lifetime of some people in this room. <laughs> Not sure about me. Uh, no, this is going to take decades. You know? I mean, we're going to make progress over the next few years. Uh, perhaps, you know, if we're lucky, uh, progress that will go faster than we expect. Uh, but um, but this, this, is not, this is not three years from now. Um, this is most likely not five years from now. Probably more than 10 years. And maybe within 20, okay? So, uh, so that's a guess. Now, when I'm saying this, I'm taking a huge risk because every single AI researcher in the past, in the history of AI for the last 65 or 70 years has been overly optimistic about those kinds of predictions and uh, turned out to be wrong. So there is this phenomenon that, uh, you know, when there is sort of a new paradigm, a new way of, uh, you know, getting machines to, to do new things, we think that's it, that's the secret. Now we have the secret of, uh, uh, intelligence and you know within 10 years we'll have machines that are as smart as humans. People have been saying this every five years since 1955 uh, and they've been wrong obviously. Um, some of the companies that are uh, you know very well established in the uh, AI business today started out 10 years ago telling everyone their investors AGI is just around the corner three years from now. They were wrong. The technique they were advocating turned out to not be as, uh, uh, you know, as, as good as, what they, as what, they, what they thought. And so uh, I may be another one of those when I t I'm telling you this, you know, 20-year framework. But is there a breakthrough that needs to happen to reach that level of human-level intelligence? Are we looking at more data? Are we looking at more computing power? Is there some algorithm that still needs to be developed that will be like, boom, we've, we've, we've unlocked it? Okay, so... Certainly comp comp computation, more, pa more compute power is going to help. There's no question that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, what we need is new architectures. When you say new algorithm, it depends what kind of algorithms you're talking about. So the basic algorithm we use for uh, deep learning is called backpropagation to adjust the parameters, right? That's with us. Like, that's going to stay with us. Uh, we don't have any good replacement for this or any even basic idea of how we could replace this. So this works really well. We're going to keep that. So deep learning is here to stay. That's the basis of future AI systems. Um, but what we need are four breakthroughs, basically. Uh, one is um, the ability for systems to learn how the world works, mostly by observation and a bit by interactions, the way babies learn how the world works in the first few, year, few months of life. Um, and similar to how you know, baby animals also, also learn how the world works. So it turns out, um, you can, in principle, do this by training a system to predict. So you show a system. So that's the way LLMs are trained, right? You, you show uh, a large neural network a piece of text, and you mask the end of the text, and you ask the system to predict the next word in that text. And if the system is properly trained on trillions of, uh, of words, uh, then it can produce the next word, and then you shift that into the input, and it produces the next next word, and et cetera. It's called autoregressive prediction. That's how all LLMs work today. Now, if you want people, uh, systems like this to understand how the world works, why don't you do this with video? So replace the words by video frames, and then ask the system to predict what's going to happen next in the video. Predicting the next frame is too easy. You have to ask it to predict uh, uh, multiple frames. And basically, we don't know how to do this properly. It doesn't work for 
video. What works for text doesn't work for video. And the only technique that, uh, so far, that has a chance of working for video is a new architecture that I've called JEPA, that means Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture. I'm not going to explain to you what it is, but here is the funny thing. It's not a generative architecture. So, uh, the, so the joke I'm saying is not a joke at all. I really believe this. The future of AI is not generative. A lot of people now are talking about generative AI, like it's you know the kind of the new thing. I think if we find ways to get machines to learn how the world works, they're not going to be generative. Um, so you know it's new new architectures, right? So getting machines to understand how the world works by basically watching video, um, and the amount of data that we already have for this is more than enough. We we just don't know what to do with it. Uh, uh, to give you a comp uh, Comparison, uh, a four-year-old child has been awake 16,000 hours in his overall life. 16,000 hours of video is 30 minutes of YouTube upload, so we have plenty of video, no problem. And it's m much, much richer than all the text available on, uh, on the internet, uh, which is why we need to get systems to become intelligent. We need them to be trained from, from high bandwidth signals like video. Text is just not sufficient. Um, so that, that's the first thing. The second thing is systems that can uh, store and remember, basically have an associative memory. In the human brain, there is a particular piece of the brain called the hippocampus that serves as our episodic short-term and long-term memory. If you don't have a hippocampus, you can't remember things for more than a few minutes, two minutes. Um, and LLMs today don't have persistent memory. The, the only memory is the pump that you give them. Um, and that's just not a good thing. Third thing is uh, reasoning. LLMs cannot reason. They just produce one word after the other without planning in advance what they're going to say. Uh, when we, most of us speak, we plan in advance what we're going to say. <laughs> um, and then the last thing is uh, uh, planning, particularly hierarchical planning. When we want to execute a task, uh, even a very simple one, we plan that task. And a cat can do this, a, good, a dog can do this. No AI system today can do this. At least no LLM can do this. The only systems that can do a bit of planning are the ones that play games like, like chess and Go. They predict in advance what the possible moves are. Um, but, but to some extent, that's actually simple for computers to do this kind of planning. Planning in the real world is much, much harder. We don't know how to do it. Thank you, Lan. I want to end with, with maybe this last question. Um, we are at the World Government Summit. We have government officials, we have academia, we have researchers, uh, we have policymakers from over 140 countries. Um, it's a very unique opportunity for you to be able to give them maybe one piece of advice when it comes to AI, uh, for them to take back when they go home to think about. What would that be? Okay, I'm going to give several pieces of advice. First one is uh, you need AI sovereignty in, in your country, your region, your cultural community or linguistic community. And if you want sovereignty, because those large models are so expensive to train, for the same reason we don't need you know, 10 different types of internet, for the same reason we don't need 10 different highways to go from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, you just need one. You only need a few base models that are open source so that anyone can do whatever they want with it. Okay? So the first thing is don't legislate open source AI out of existence because of imaginary fears of dangers that don't exist. Um, you know, premature regulation in that, in that sense is, is very bad. Um, uh, so that's the first recommendation. Second recommendation, the biggest obstacle to the dissemination of AI within industry and uh, everyday use and everything is uh, uh, education and training. So train your population, uh, educate them about, about AI and access to computing resources. So if you have a way of creating a national uh, computing resource for academics, for startups, um, so that you know, it sort of lowers the barrier of entry, you can create an ecosystem of AI on top of it, do it. And then figure out how to use the, 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 you know, your archive, your cultural archives, and uh, use them to train, to fine tune base LLMs for your culture, your language, your value systems, and your centers of interest. That's my recommendations.
Thank you, Your Highness, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us and a special round of applause for Jan Lacun for joining us at the World Government Summit. Thank, thank you. you very much.